Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Michael Schaefer. And I'm Fiona Bennett. Lovely, Lovely to, to see, see you, see you. <laughs> uh, We say that every episode, Fee, but of course it's always true. It is very true. Now, we wanted to begin this month's episode by reminding you, if, uh, if you weren't already aware, that we are going to be holding our online evening of poetry readings that we call In the Company of Poems. And we're going to be doing that on February the 21st at 7 o'clock GMT. It'll be about an hour and we've already got some fantastic guests joining us, some incredible readers of poems. Myself and Fiona will be there as well, reading some poems. Uh, but we've got the incredible Roy McFarlane, Degna Stone and Hannah Jane Walker. There are more to be announced. Make sure you follow our Instagram with all the updates for who else is going to be joining us. We've done this twice before now, Fee, is that right? Yes. Yeah, and it's been a really popular event. It is a fundraising event for us at the Poetry Exchange. It helps us to keep doing the work that we're doing and keep making the podcast and making sure it's free for everyone. So your support is really appreciated and it's a fantastic evening. You can buy tickets. There's a link on our website, thepoetryexchange.co.uk, and that will take you through to Eventbrite, I believe, and you can get your ticket there. How much is it, Fee? It's sort of a pay what you can with a minimum suggestion. That's right, yeah. So we want to keep it as open as we can as we do everything. And what are we going to be doing on, on that evening, Fiona? It's a little bit different to the podcast because it's less conversation mm. and more pure poetry. So it's a sort of feast of listening and hearing poems. Yeah, a sonic feast is really the way to describe it, I think. And we'll be reading poems that we've already introduced you to. Maybe there might be some favourites in there that we know people have enjoyed in the past, but many new ones too. And we'll be inviting our guest readers to bring along a poem that's been a friend to them lately too. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So, Michael, this month's episode is a very special episode that we're dedicating to our dear friend and colleague who very sadly died at the end of last year, the brilliant and extraordinary Martin Heaney, who may be known to some of the listeners who are listening. He may indeed be a colleague or a friend of some of those out there, and some of you may know him through his episode of the Poetry Exchange, which came a few years ago when he brought us the Lake Isle of Innisfree. But we wanted to take this moment to think about him and to honour him. And to honour him, there are so many things to say, um, but especially in the context of the Poetry Exchange, what he has brought to us as a supporter of the project from the beginning his dedication to words and his dedication to the importance and the power of the reading of poetry, something that Martin understood in a very particular and unique way. And when I was starting thinking out about the project, he was, he was very close to the ideas and came and gave views and advice and all the brilliant things that he always did. Um, with a unique lens and a unique ear. So as a great reader of poetry, he's always been a very close friend to the project. And indeed, as a great friend to me and to many others, his championing of friendship itself is also part of what has fueled this project. He, in his natural connecting way, had introduced us to the wonderful guest who we're going to hear from this month, who is a very close and old friend of Martin's. Martin having introduced us to Simon, who we're going to be hearing from, it felt like a joining of the circle of friendship to bring a conversation with Simon this month as a dedication to Martin. So you'll be listening to myself and Michael talking about The Thrush by Ed Thomas, the poem that's been a friend 
to Simon. Would you just give it a read out loud for us? Certainly, yeah. When winter's ahead, what can you read in November that you read in April when winter's dead? I hear the thrush and I see him alone at the end of the lane near the bare poplar's tip, singing continuously. Is it more that you know than that, even as in April, so in November, winter is gone that must go? Or is all your law not to call November, November, and April, April, and winter, winter, no more? But I know the months all, and their sweet names, April, May, and June, and October. As you call and call, I must remember what died into April, and consider what will be born of a fair November. And April I love for what it was born of, and November for what it will die in, what they are, and what they are not. While you love what is kind, what you can sing in, and love and forgetting all that's ahead and behind. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's it's a very difficult poem to read, actually. And I, I'm not sure it's an entirely easy poem to understand. The meaning washes over you in a kind of very non-specific way from the very start. I confess I struggled slightly with it, if I'm honest, Simon. I was going, oh, I'm not sure I understand this one, Fiona. I think when you mentioned to me that it might be your friend, I think you maybe said it's a bit of a riddle. It does feel that. And of course, as you've so rightly said, there's a carrier wave of meaning in it that we perhaps grasp without analysing it too much. Yes. So what we love to know here is is what it is to you, Simon, and, and perhaps when it came into your life. Well, the question of when it came into my life is an interesting one because I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I'll tell the story. I was probably uh, not in the best of places. This was about 10, 12 years ago. My mum hadn't long been, she died not, not that long before that. And I, I was kind of feeling a bit lost and I got some very good friends who own a little cottage in Steep, the village of Steep in Hampshire. Uh, which is where Edward Thomas spent much of his life and where he wrote much of his poetry. So they invited me to stay there, so I, I, I did, and I had a fabulous time there, writing a lot, um, thinking a lot. And in fact, I took, um, I knew that some of the last books my mum had read had been Edward Thomas and the biography of him because they were they were still lying open in her flat. So I took those with, with me and, and I read quite a lot. Edward Thomas during his life kind of spent so much time walking and writing about nature and what he saw. So I did the walks around Steep, what he did along the hangers, which are these beautiful hills. And, but by the end of it, I was kind of, uh, I was feeling much better, but kind of worried about going back and what I, what I do and all the things awaiting me. And I remember, and I, I know it, it, it happened because I've got a little video of it on the final day of my trip there. I was walking along a lane in Steep and saw a thrush high in a poplar tree. Well, I don't know if it was a poplar tree. It was in a tree, singing beautifully. And I remember stopping and thinking, and uh, the thought that I had was the thought in this poem, or at least the thought in its simplest form, which is basically, I wonder what, how the world looks to that thrush. It's a little bit weird because I know probably I had read the Edward T Thomas poem before that, but I don't know that. And it's odd because it's not in the anthologies that I was reading at the time. <laughs> and I must have read it after that. I, well, I don't know. I might have read it before. I might have read it after. But I suppose that's not the point. It's that the, the, the poem has become kind of part of that. I can't read the poem without thinking of that moment. Whether I've imposed my interpretation on the poem from my thought or whether I, my thought was a reinterpretation of Edward Thomas, I don't know. But they're kind of closely linked, really. And, and I've liked it ever since, really. And I think it's partly because it also just works on, a, on that really simple level that I, I do. I love walking. It's when I think. 
I don't know that we've ever had something like that before, Michael, where where the image of the poem has actually happened no. in quite the way that you just described it so beautifully, Simon. It's, it's extraordinary. It, it sounds a little bit pretentious, and I'm very against getting pretentious about uh, poems, but I kind of do feel something happened there. You know, I could, I could have chosen many other poems from different points in my life, but I think over my recent years, this is the one that probably has stuck with me most, been a friend to me most. It's such a beautiful story, Simon, and I very much resonate with what you're saying about walking and what happens in those moments that you describe so beautifully. And actually, it's really kind of opened up the poem for me, hearing you talk about that. Just in that first stanza, it seems to me the poet is thinking into the future and then thinking of the past in the way that, that you described. And then he goes to the thrush, who's completely in exactly. the present. You know? yeah. yeah. When winter's ahead, what can you read in November is in the future that you read in April, you know? And it, it's like that's such a clever and very simple way of capturing that thing that we all do find ourselves stuck in our head, think, you know, worrying about what will happen and concerning ourselves with stuff that, that's happened in the past. And yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, no, I feel I feel that I feel that he's. I mean, Edward Thomas did get depressed a lot, and he's he's not in a great state of mind at the start. It seems to me he's saying, "Winter's ahead." I'm feeling glum. How can I recreate how I felt in April when with the you know the summer ahead of me? Now November's here. What is it about now that's different than April? Right. Where can I find the hope that I found when it, when it was April? That's how I read that. And then, as you say, he, he goes on and, and it's like a break. And then suddenly from the thought, he hears a thrush and just the singing continuously. So then he goes into this meditation in some way, or this thought about what, what is going on in the thrush's head. What are they thinking? And is it just a simple view of the world whereby everything comes together? There's no, there's no fear or there's no hope. You know, winter comes and winter goes. Or maybe she just don't have words for these things. You know, maybe you just accept everything as being one big whole that you don't have the worries that we do about defining things. The year is one and worries and hopes and fears are one. It's interesting, isn't it, how he does that sort of comparison with himself and the thrush? Yes. Or is all your law not to call November, November, and April, April, and winter, winter, no more? And then he goes, but I know the months all, as you call and yes. call. Yes. It's sort of deceptively brilliant, isn't it? I mean, it's sort of apparently sort of quite simple. There's not difficult language in this. It's not, you know, no allusions to classical mythology. But actually, it's incredibly skillful, isn't it? Absolutely. You're right. It's conversational. It's 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 almost he is having a, a chat with himself and a chat with the thrush. It's it's the thought that matters to him. What can I learn from the fact that you're just sitting at the top of a tree, singing your heart out? But it has to come back to how he feels, and he kind of. But I think when he comes back to how he feels, he's already in better state of mind than he was at the start. He's saying, "Well, actually, I, I'm not like you." I, I know all the names of the month, but they're sweet names. He loves them. Um, mm. In so few words as well. I mean, so concise. It's astonishingly concise, isn't it? I mean, just a handful of words in a line. What's he saying for you here, Simon, in this sixth stanza? He's, it's almost like he's beginning to draw some sort of a conclusion here or something, or it's a sort of note to self. I must remember what died into April and consider what will be born of a fair November. Is that some hope? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think he's saying, okay, I must remember what you're telling me. April is a time of dying, but it's also a time of rebirth. And the same with November. Whatever time of year it is, you get both. Basically, you remember what died in one month. But each month gives rise to something else as well. So, and it's almost a kind of anti-nostalgic thing. See, I think, again, and this is something I see very much in myself, I think he's worried not just about the future and what it might bring, but about being nostalgic about the past. 
And I, I think he's saying what the thrush teaches us is, is you look at everything as one. That makes complete sense to me. And I really love that last stanza where he returns to the thrush. Yeah. While you love what is kind, what you can sing in and love and forget in, all that's ahead and behind. That's amazing. I think that word kind is so extraordinary. Yes, I do. I'm not quite sure. It could either mean kind as in gentle and kind to each other, or it could mean kind, the things that are like a kind of family of... Yeah, right, your kindred kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. Something about the way that it goes into that also makes me feel that it is a return to the thrush, but that it's also somehow him. Yes. I mean, there's an I behind that you. Mm. that he he comes to the perspective of the thrush to some degree as you did in that moment when you saw it simon well i i yes i, I wouldn't pretend ever to to have the complexity of thought and expression that, that edward thomas did but there's a, a similarity there those moments though in nature when you're walking and something there's an epiphany isn't there oh, that's the only word i can think of you you have an epiphany when it happens, it's very special. And you you can't really put it into words, actually. So this seems to me like a kind of perfect thing that you would have that experience, not have to put it into words, and then find the poem yes. <laughs> that's done it for you. <laughs> sort of perfect. Yes, I, and I think, I think it's also the fact that he's so wondrous that he has put such a complex argument into how many eight short stanzas where the meanings are open, but, you know, it, it has quite an emotional response in you. And I think part of it is in that final stanza, because it, it, you're right, Fiona, I think it is a kind of resolution. And I think, to me, it's almost like a bird song. Before that, it's all a little bit staccato. But towards the end, it seems to me that, that this wonderful kind of suddenly gathers pace into this sort of stream of thought which I just, I just love. And it reflects the ways in which he's been changed by the experience. Something's been freed or released. Yes. I, I look at the word forget as well there in that final stanza, to love and forget in. That's an interesting word because it's not suggesting everything's rosy. In some ways, he's kind of longing for the sense of, yeah, the lack of human thought that a thrush has. He's longing for that sort of instinctive joy and love but to be able to forget all the other stuff that's going on I, I i love his lack of sentimentality he's always looking for the truth rather than for a solution and the the song in the poem is very beautiful isn't it just the sounds of it all it, it reminds me i don't know if you've read any other edward thomas um, his most famous poems, Adelstrop. Yeah, there's a definite Adelstrop moment in the middle there, isn't there? Yeah. It's that, again, that thing of just, it's a moment and just taking the thought of a moment and weaving that into something wonderful. I was just going to say, he must have been a relatively young man when he wrote this. He died in the First World War, aged 39. Yeah. The weird thing is that he wrote all his poems in the last three years of his life. He actually only wrote poetry, uh, having met Robert Frost. He'd written huge amounts of prose and diaries, and he'd been a very respected critic and done all sorts of stuff. But by, yeah, 1913, Robert Frost persuaded him to write poetry, and he did it for the three years till he died in the trenches. Also, just to say how completely incredible that you had this moment while staying in his house, in his cottage. It wasn't in his cottage, but it was in a cottage in the same village, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's close enough, you know, Simon. Yes. And to have discovered that your your mother was reading him as well. Yeah. She loved him. She she was very, I, and I remember before she died, she talked about, she loved poetry and she, particularly in her later years, she, she read a huge amount. So I kind of think that had something to do with me wanting to read more of him. 
Does this still stay with you, Simon? This this poem. Do you do you find yourself these days out on walks, maybe hearing a thrush, and this coming to mind, or do you sort of return to the page and and, and read this? How is it with you now? I think doing this has made me return to the page in a in in a way that I hadn't before. I've read it occasionally, but I, I've remembered the poem very regularly on walks. And and I kind of I actively seek out thrushes now. I just I just I just love song thrushes. And and if I hear a song thrush or see a song thrush high in a tree singing their heart out, of course I immediately think of the poem and that that time when I was in Steep. Um, and it all yeah yeah the joy is is probably all the more because of the the poem really. Now, Simon, obviously the invitation here was to bring in a poem that's been a friend to you. If you were to characterise this friend, what type of a friend would it be? A very difficult question, Michael. I think the thing I think about my very best friends are they are the ones you feel completely at ease with, that you don't have to pretend anything, you're just you, and you just say things how you feel and how they are. I think this poem is, is a terribly honest poem about his kind of state of mind, but also, you know, just charting the way he felt at a particular time and the thought, thought he had. I think it, it would be an honest friend. It would be a good friend. The Thrush by Edward Thomas When winter's ahead, what can you read in November that you read in April when winter's dead? I hear the thrush, and I see him alone at the end of the lane near the bare poplar's tip, singing continuously. Is it more that you know than that even as in April, so in November, winter is gone that must go? Or is all your law not to call November, November, and April, April, and winter, winter, no more? But I know the months all, and their sweet names, April, May and June and October, as you call and call, I must remember what died into April and consider what will be born of a fair November. And April I love for what it was born of, and November for what it will die in, what they are and what they are not while you love what is kind, what you can sing in and love and forget in, all that's ahead and behind. That was Michael with the gift reading of The Thrush by Edward Thomas. Our thanks, of course, to Simon for sharing that incredible poem and that beautiful conversation. Simon is a health journalist, editor and writer and also took the role of being a critical friend to Martin for Martin's own podcast, which is called Chatty Guy Talks Cancer, Care and Hope. And we will leave a link in the description to Martin's podcast, which is completely extraordinary. Martin talks with such great eloquence and wisdom and with this incredible perspective on living with his condition. I would thoroughly recommend it. It's quite an extraordinary thing. I've not heard anything quite like it, Faye. You mentioned that eloquence, and I think that's something that I very much associate with Martin and you feel there was a very profound understanding of the importance and the power of of the written and the spoken word that was was shared between Simon and Martin and I think one of the episodes is also a, a conversation between the two of them and we'll also leave a link 
to the episode that we did with Martin, where he talks about the importance of the Lake Isle of Innisfree for him. And in fact, we found out recently that, that Martin had known that poem and, and in fact did it, if you like, at drama school. Uh, yeah, we'll leave a link for that one as well so you can have a listen to that. It's beautiful, Ed. So, Michael, I was thinking about the bonus poem for this month and uh, in the back of my mind, I hoped that in the audio archive of the Poetry Exchange that there would still be this recording that I remember vividly Martin making with me at the start of the project of a very, very beautiful poem. But I had a little moment of thinking, oh, is it, have we still, you know, what with one thing and another online digital files go wandering, you know. But thankfully, we found it, haven't we, this morning. And it's a beautiful, beautiful reading that Martin gave of this poem when we were very early with the ideas of the project. And in fact, I'd just sent a message out to a few poets that I knew saying, can you let me know if you've got a poem that's been a friend to you? And this was brought in actually by the poet themselves. Uh, It was a friend to her in the act of writing it. And it's been a friend to many others. And she's a terrific poet called Jill McAvoy. And it's a real honour to share her poem and in particular to share Martin's gorgeous reading of it. So I think we'll finish the episode with that reading. This is Sometimes All It Takes by Jill McAvoy, read by Martin Haney. Sometimes, all it takes to be happy is a line of washing drying gently in the sun, a fork stuck in a border, sunlight falling through leaves, striking the gold rim of the blackbird's eye as it watches from the fence for the digging to be done. We'll be back with you next month with more Poems as Friends. Until then, thank you for listening.